Rock art across the world is not only one of the earliest forms of self-expression in prehistoric Homo sapiens, but was also used to convey ideas and beliefs between the artists, their contemporaries, and the future generations of their group. In archaeology, rock art allows us a look into the belief systems of ancient humans, with rock art in recent years being linked to ritual practices by archaeologists such as Ross and Davidson and Lewis Williams, with Rappaport claiming that ritual is not simply an alternate way to express any manner of thing, but that certain meanings and effect can best or even only be achieved in ritual. With such importance placed upon ritual in the past, ochre-based rock art, particularly that of Australian Aboriginals, is one of the most plentiful and accessible mediums through which archaeologists can study past beliefs. As well as the intangible meanings behind the rock art, these findings also indicate that Homo sapiens as far back as the Middle Stone Age were capable of long-term planning and were capable of grasping the beginnings of chemical knowledge. The art's survival into the modern day, though, relies on many variables, one of which being the binding agent used in the ochre mixture. The aim of this experiment was to investigate the effectiveness of various binding agents in a red ochre mixture, while other ochres contain some degree of octahedral iron oxides. Hematite is most prevalent in red ochres, as shown in Elias et al. 2006. As such, the second half of this experiment was to test if increasing the amount of hematite in a red ochre mixture would increase its adhesiveness. The introduction of this video contained clips of myself breaking down the soft ochre rock on a sandstone anvil into a fine dust so that it could be mixed with various binding agents. Binding agents tested in this experiment were charcoal, water, animal oil, and vegetable fat, with the straight ochre dust as a control. These binding agents were chosen as they appear often across the world, with oils and waters being used throughout Australia, while oils and charcoal have been used for the creation of ancient artworks across the world, like those found in France's Lascaux Caves, or the artist tool kits excavated in the Blombos Caves in South Africa. The ochre mixtures were prepared with a quarter teaspoon of ochre and a quarter teaspoon of the binding agent in question. Once all the mixtures were prepared, the experiments were carried out. First to be tested was a once-off piece of straight ochre rock, comparing its effectiveness with ochre mixtures. What was quickly discovered was the ochre rock was deceptively difficult to get a thick line and was more prone to cutting into the sandstone than leaving a red ochre mark. After each test was left to dry, they were each swept over by a high pressure hose to simulate thousands of years of moisture accumulation and weather damage. This would be how we decided the effectiveness of the binding agents. As you can see, the straight ochre rock did not fare very well. Between each test, the sandstone was dried to the best of our ability to ensure the next test would not absorb any unneeded water. The first mixture tested was our control, the ochre dust. As well as being easier to draw with than the straight ochre rock, the ochre dust did manage to leave residual marks after the water damage was applied. Our second test was an ochre water mix. While this mixture was easier to apply again than the dust, I believed that it would not brave the weather damage any better than the dust. I was correct. Next was the ochre charcoal mix. This mixture was just as time consuming as the straight ochre dust to apply, but ideally the charcoal would be the first of our binding agents to achieve a higher level of adhesiveness than the ground ochre on its own. We expect to see this as charcoal is the first tested binding agent that regularly appears in ancient rock art, such as the White Lady in Namibia, Southern Africa. Here we can see that the charcoal ochre mix has survived better than the water mix in the insert, if only by a margin. The fourth mix was the first of our oil mixtures, the ochre animal oil mix. I expected this mixture to be as easy to apply as the water, although the outcome could have been positive due to the oil's water resistance, or negative if its size and density caused it to get blown away.
What we found was the animal oil mix was incredibly rigid, even when swept over multiple times with the high pressure stream. The last of our standard ochre mixtures was the ochre vegetable oil mix. Considering the outcome of the animal oil mixture, we had high expectations for this test. What we found was that the oil's natural resistance to water far outweighed any drawback that it might have encountered, such as weight and density causing it to get blown away. Hematite is used both as a pigment and binding agent in rock art, as it naturally occurs in ochre and as a mineral iron oxide on its own, becoming a vibrant purple when ground down. When hematite is the dominant iron oxide in an ochre rock, the colour appears redder, while if the dominant iron oxide is joethite, the ochre appears more yellow. As our ochre is therefore rich in hematite already, it was decided early on in our research that its binding qualities should be tested as well. We achieved this by repeating the last group of tests, but this time adding a quarter teaspoon of hematite to each mixture and comparing the new results to the hematiteless results. We began again with the ochre dust, this time with the added hematite. Despite not knowing how the hematite would act as a binding agent, I did not hold out much hope for the survival of the ochre hematite mix. Despite my doubts, the hematite ochre dust mix survived much better than its predecessor, appearing more visible than the straight ochre dust mix seen in the insert. While this initially seemed like proof that hematite was a viable binding agent, I continued with the test to reinforce my findings. Next was the ochre hematite water mix a mixture I now expected to fare better than the previous ochre water mix that was white from the sandstone with ease, previously. Despite the presence of the hematite, this mixture seemed to have poorer results than the water mixture without hematite pictured in the insert. This may be as a result of the second sweep of water during this test, however. Our fourth hematite test was an ochre hematite charcoal mix, which was as difficult to spread as the previous charcoal mix, but also visibly more purple in colour as a result of the hematite. The results between charcoal tests were very similar although the hematite mixture seemed to be more resilient to the initial spray. The penultimate test for hematite's binding capabilities was the ochre hematite animal oil mix, a combination I had no doubts about after the previous test with animal oil. The mixture held up as expected despite the second pass over with the high pressure spray. While this is good news for the mixture itself, as the combination of ochre and animal oil has been proven previously to be very effective, it also makes it very difficult to spot if the hematite is actually having an effect beyond adding a dash of purple to the image. And now our final test, the ochre hematite vegetable oil mix. Despite smelling a lot better than the previous mixture, this test performed very similarly to the animal oil and to its own previous test. Once again, it is difficult to tell in this case whether the hematite is having an effect or if the oil is the only binding agent in action. By reviewing the results of my experiment, I have determined that both animal oils and vegetable oils, like those used by Aboriginal Australians in rock shelters at Namagni in the Gudjanbi Valley, for example, were the ideal binding agent for ochre-based rock art. Despite their appeal as a binding agent, these fattens and oils could also provide vital nourishment if need be, so it seems likely they would not have been used frivolously. Charcoal was also effective, to a lesser extent, and would be easier to use if water was added to the mixture. Hematite, in addition to its vibrant purple colouring, 
does indeed have some binding capabilities, which are particularly noticeable when there are fewer other binding agents in the same mixture. In hematite's case, however, the colour it produces may very well be more sought after than its binding capabilities, a prospect that could perhaps be covered ethnographically in future research.